Welcome back, everyone. Now, um, I hope you've all got the pre-conference report. Looks like this. And if you haven't, it's uh, available on the website. You can download it on UppsalaHealthSummit.se. And it, in this report, uh, the introduction is written by the chair of the Uppsala Health Summit Programme Committee, Professor Karin Brocki. And she writes like this. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological and social well-being. Our mental health includes the way we feel, think and act. The state of our mental health influences how we handle stress, relationships and how we make decisions in life, big and small. At the same time, growing mental ill health is one of the world's most acute public health challenges with billions of people suffering from mental problems. One of the greatest barriers is stigma and the need to make prevention of mental ill health a public health priority is very clear. Now, Karin Brocki, professor, is with me here in the studio. Welcome, Karin. Thank you. Your introduction to this summit and to the uh, pre-conference report uh, is very clear to the point and quite alarming. And entering this second session for today that we called Towards a New Understanding of Mental Health and Well-Being, um, we will get three different perspectives on the challenges that we endure and how we can defy old notions and work in new ways. Now, when the program committee uh, set this title, New Understanding, what did you mean by that and what did you hope to gain in this session? So, as we have heard here today, mental health is such a complex construct and there's uh, uh, several principles that are key in the understanding of mental health. But I think uh, two of the most uh, important ones is... Uh, how important it is to move away from the categorical perspective on uh, mental health, that it needs to be understood as a continuum with uh, normality, uh, so that it's quite normal for us to feel symptoms of depression or anxiety or sleeping problems um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Uh, but it also means that uh, even though we don't reach the clinical level of a disorder, we might need support and uh, treatment. Uh, and as it is today, uh, there are quite a lot of people who don't get the support and, and help that they need because they don't reach uh, the clinical levels. And I think it's very important to... Uh, that's uh, an area that we need to work with so that we don't wait until the symptoms are actually turning into a disorder. Uh, so early intervention, both in terms of... Uh, in before symptoms have turned into a disorder, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, childhood. So when uh, mental uh, ill health is uh, developing early in life, we need to prevent. Mm. Mm. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I understand to uh, to be there in time mm. and not when it's maybe a bit too late or exactly. yeah, it's been too far. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now we'll see what we will hear on this session. Uh, and our first speaker in this session is Dr. Christian Ryck, professor in psychiatry at Karolinska Institute here in Sweden and a practicing psychiatrist. He's the author of over 140 reviewed research articles and recently published the popular, pop, popular science book Olyckliga i paradiset, or in English, Unhappy in Paradise. Where in this book he takes us on a journey in the history of mental health and also discusses the expanding role of the psychi psychiatric diagnosis as a tool to interpret human suffering. Now, I read this book with much interest. And I read, for example, from the book, what is the reason for diagnosis to have increased? Could one thing be that we've changed our view on what is to be acknowledged as a deceased has changed? A little bit of what you talked about also, Karen. Now, welcome, Dr. Christian Ryck. The screen is yours. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. So, and I'm very honored to be in such a, a distinguished panel. Uh, so, so the topic of my talk is uh, is uh, about why mental health problems keep lingering on at the same degree in a country like Sweden. So, so I have a, in some way a little bit of a non-global perspective and outlook here, but I hope that the rest of the speakers will, uh, will make up for that. Um, so... Um, 
Well, m- my take on what's going on is that, uh, for instance, in Sweden, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I really don't share the the uh, view that you often hear in media that uh, some parts of the world have a tsunami of mental health issues going on. But but I, I think for the majority of the population, we have stable levels of most psychiatric symptoms if you use the population surveys that we have in Sweden, for instance. Um, and but, but the share of diagnosed and treated individuals uh, of the population is increasing. Clearly, the share of uh, sick leave diagnoses that are psychiatric has in Sweden not reached, or reached almost 50%. And in man, many countries in the Western world, they are on the way up. So, so the, the proportion of health problems that, that are psychiatric seems to be increasing in many places in the world. Uh, the, the problems don't affect everyone at the same rate, but, but younger people seem more affected than, than women, more than men in general. Uh, so I guess the, the, the issue that I'm interested in here is that now, now that Sweden is uh, a country that has invested so much in health and, uh, and the factors that we think about as risk factors for psychiatric disorders, why, why are not the levels decreasing substantially of psychiatric problems? Um, so I, I will have some good news to share too, not, not, not to make the, you know, may make this too gloomy here. And I think there are some, or there are many, many good news here. And one is that we see that suicide is decreasing globally in almost all countries. Uh, it, it even decreased last year, where many people had a very negative outlook on mental health due to the pandemic. Um, I, I would say that in general, we have reasonably good treatment results for most psychiatric disorders. It's certainly not perfect, but it's also not, not um, really bad. Um, we even can see some population level effects on ADHD, for instance, on ADHD medication that violent crime, car accidents decrease due to treatment. It's, it's unusual in our field to show population effects, but there are some signs of that. I would also say that treatment options generally in most parts of the world uh, are becoming more accessible. Uh, but, but there is a long way to go to make uh, psychiatric treatment uh, something that everyone who needs it gets. Um, now then, what, what's the problem? Well, I think the, the one issue here is that symptom levels don't decrease over time. Uh, also, it doesn't seem to help to be a very rich country compared to a poorer country. Um, of course, there are many other positive uh, things uh, health-wise uh, in Sweden, but here um, it doesn't seem to be the obvious solution to the problem. There is also somewhat of a paradox when it comes to treatment on the population level, because we, we treat more and more people with depression, as an example, but depression does not seem to become less prevalent. So expanding to treatment, which we should do, for many, there are many good reasons to that, may also not solve uh, this uh, issue. Another issue that, that is very complicated, and I think it becomes an issue mostly when uh, prevalent rates go up, prevalence rates go up. So for many psychiatric disorders, there is huge underdiagnosis in all countries. Uh, but for some uh, disorders, they actually have become very prevalent. So at least in, in Sweden, and I think in the US also, for instance, ADHD and autism has, has gone in a few decades from a very un- from very unusual diagnosis to very common ones in Sweden, certainly 
more common than you would expect from, from prevalence studies. So then the, the, the unclear boundaries of psychiatric diagnosis become more of an issue for society. And these boundaries, I, I guess, will always remain um, a bit un unclear because that's how the diagnoses are constructed. It's, there is not, um, they are uh, sensitive to, to context. Um, I think one, one uh, the best illustration of this, um, um, uh, of this phenomenon that psychiatric diagnosis or symptoms, like the symptoms of depression, they overlap heavily with with non-pathological uh, phenomenon as well. And I think Amy Silverberg in this tweet nailed this quite nicely. So it could be an anxiety disorder, but it could also just be the person you are married to. So um, I, I think most people would agree that um, not all human suffering should be interpreted as, as a psychiatric diagnosis. And in this illustration, the, the larger circle is just suffering. And the inner circle is the suffering that we uh, classify as psychiatric, a psychiatric diagnosis. So not, not everything should be classified as it, but certainly also not nothing. So where how much of suffering that should be um, uh, classified as psychiatric diagnosis is up to us. Uh, and I, I, I want to acknowledge that I understand that this may be a non-issue in many countries where it's very hard to get the psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. So it's mostly an issue in countries that where a greater po uh, part of the population are diagnosed. And, and the one of the problems is, of course, that psychiatric phenotypes or symptoms or problems are almost always a variation. If you take social anxiety or um, um, depressed mood or attention or anything like that, there will be a variation and you somewhere you have to dichotomize it to make a diagnosis. And where you do that will affect how many get the diagnosis and not. And that's just the way it is. It's not much you can do about it, but it's also, I think, important for us in the medical field to acknowledge that diagnoses aren't as precise as we like to think that they are. And I, I guess one qu question that fascinates me is how psychiatry and psychology has become the go-to solution for human suffering in some countries of the world. I, I say again, not, not, not to seem too ignorant of the world outside of Sweden. Um, well, I think one, one reason for that is that it seems to work for people. Uh, while we as psychiatrists rarely feel, feel popular, uh, maybe that's why we ended up in psychiatry in the first place, but uh, Clearly, a psychiatric diagnosis and treatment is something very popular and seems has meaning to people. Um, and, but I also think that other uh, systems of understanding such suffering in some countries have just uh, lost um, popularity or whatever you would say. So for instance, in, in most people in the world believe in an almighty God. And if God is almighty, you actually have a, a, a explanation for suffering and the context for suffering. It may not be, you know, fully explain your individual problems, but certainly there is a lot of emphasis on suffering in most religions. Another, I think, system to make uh, for understanding suffering is a political uh, understanding. And in Sweden, for instance, we had a um, social democratic movement for about a hundred years. And, and in, 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 th in this um, context, understanding why people suffer and try to remove 
injustice and other things that cause the suffering is a way of both understanding suffering and removing suffering. And I, I, my thinking is that uh, most of these collective explanations of suffering uh, have lost importance in, for instance, Sweden, and we resort to individual explanations of suffering. And, the, and that's where a medical diagnosis fits like a glove. Uh, one worry that I have is that it may lead to a, a more medical view of suffering, may lead to a to uh, uh, to make to to a view where suffering isn't normal anymore. It's seen as something we should be able to is extinguish or just make go away to an extent that may become problematic. And I, I use the term neurotic threadmill here, and and I. It, it's probably not a very common term. I, I took it from a dissertation that's, that was published at the Department of Psychology at Harvard just recently by someone, by uh, Peyton Jones. It's a very interesting concept and a very interesting dissertation. And the, the idea is that if adversity decreases in society, which is something I think we all would think is a good thing, then people become more, more vul vulnerable meaning that there will be a kind of a thread mill you, you, you get stuck in here. So, uh, and, and Sweden is probably one of the countries with, with the lowest societal adversity for people in general. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but in general, it's a safe place, a rich place, etc. So in line with this idea, then at the richer spectrum of the world um, where violence is going down and other things, adver uh, adverse things are going down. We may then have the issue that, for instance, the, the, the concepts of psychopathology are expanding. So trauma may, uh, and, and that this is something that Peyton Jones uh, examines in his thesis here is that uh, if, if you take typical uh, descriptions of trauma, people uh, who live in a safer place tend to describe more things as trauma. So there is a bracket creep, an expansion of, of the psychiatric concept in a safer context. Uh, so in some way, it may be that, for instance, in Sweden, that we, we, we should prepare for that mental health problems uh, will not be solved by just getting richer and richer and putting more and more money into the, the, the different uh, projects uh, surrounding this. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to uh, uh, if that sounded a bit pessimistic, but I, I think it, it's good to be to prepare for a situation in the best possible way. So what can we do then? So I think, of course, we, we can do a lot by just providing treatment to people with mental health problems. And there is certainly a lot more to be done there. Uh, we know that in many disorders, a minority of people get the, 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 the treatments that they should get, e even in, in the countries in the world that have the most resources. I think one other thing is to, in, in countries where the prevalence rates are high, like in Sweden, for instance, I think it's also important to understand both the benefits and the limitations of the medical model as an explanation for human suffering and for, for the creation of meaning to individuals. Uh, and I think the we should probably, or we should uh, realize the mental health problems are here to stay. And they will probably become a bigger share of health problems over time as many other health problems. Uh, there we have solutions that make them less prevalent. So I, I'm, I, I would foresee that mental health problems will become a bigger and bigger problem for society. And, and I, I would say in Sweden, it's, it's our biggest health uh, um, challenge that, that we have ahead of us. 
Uh, and, and, and I know in, in this session, we, we will hear from Dr. Shibanda here about the bench projects. And I think there are uh, the realization that the medical model uh, has limitations to me also says that we should learn from others. Uh, we should also learn from, from uh, what, what solution can be that we can use that do not come from from the medical sector or the psychiatric sector. So that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, have, we do have a few questions for you. Um, some clarifications about the statement on suicide. Uh, what accounts for the reduction in suicide? And also, um, can we say that suicide rate is going down globally or was that in Sweden? Well, I think the notable exception is the United the US. Uh, globally, we can say that. Uh, um, and I mean, over, over a longer period of time, it's, it's a substantial decrease. And I think one of the reasons is that the, the means, uh, you know, the ways that you can die by suicide uh, have been re reduced in, in many countries. It, it's, it's harder to do it uh, because, well, for instance, in uh, you know, farm chemicals that, that were used a lot in some countries have been uh, harder to come by, for instance. So that's, th that is a positive global trend. I, I... Mm. Good, thank you. Uh, please stay on and we will have a, a panel discussion uh, later on after hearing the two more speakers. So uh, just one more question then, Christian. Will your book come out in English soon? Uh, not that I know of, but maybe <laughs> being on the Uppsala Health Summit will change things. Perhaps. <laughs> I think that should be a good thing. Okay, we'll stay on. And, uh, and now we're ready for our next speaker, uh, our second speaker in this session. That's going to give us the overall picture on what is needed in places where resources are limited. Now, he has an ambition of making pre preventive care and treatment more available despite structural constraints such as poverty, inequality and social injustice. Now, please welcome Dr. Vikram Patel, Professor of Global Health at Harvard Medical School and Professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan Music School, <laughs> Chan School of Public Health from the U.S. Now, good morning. I know it's early morning for you, Vikram, but uh, please tell us about your work. Thanks very much. Uh, so actually, I'm going to be talking about what I think is perhaps the missed opportunity to reduce uh, the burden of mental health problems. I don't actually think uh, uh, that just providing more treatment is going to achieve that. In no, uh, no other area of medicine has treatment actually singularly contributed to reducing the incidence and burden of a health problem. It's always really relied on prevention across virtually every single health condition across history. And so what I really want to focus on is is uh, thinking about uh, what are the most promising targets for prevention in the mental health sector by focusing on the science uh, of early life development uh, and how that can translate into opportunities for prevention in all populations. So I want to start off by acknowledging that this grumpy man who many of us in, uh, in mental health have dismissed because his ideas were out of date um, was actually probably one of the most important thinkers in the field uh, of mental health because more than 100 years ago, this man, even though he looks very upset, actually demonstrated or actually made an observation um, that mental health problems that he was seeing in his adult patients in fact had their origins in childhood. Of course, this is Sigmund Freud who then went on uh, to concoct his own explanation as to why these childhood experiences were associated with mental health problems. And while it is absolutely true that this explanation has not stood uh, uh, the grounds of scientific scrutiny over the last hundred years, the fundamental observation has actually borne true. So much so that today it is no longer questioned that adversities in early childhood are profoundly associated with poor mental health and indeed poor physical health across the life course, that there is a dose response relationship between adversities. And this has been demonstrated in every single culture and context in which this question has been asked. Today, it's widely acknowledged that preventing adverse childhood experiences would prevent a very large number of mental health and other behavioral health conditions. 
Of course, when we think of adversities, we often think of extreme events, such as the ones shown on this particular slide, which we think might affect only a small minority of children and would not explain the population burden or mental health problems. However, in fact, we now know that the most common adversity is economic difficulties, growing up in a household that is relatively or absolutely poor. And in this regard, every country in the world has inequities in terms of income distribution or access to material resources that enable their par parents to provide nurturing environments for very young children. And you can also see a bunch of other uh, adverse childhood experiences. And I'm pretty sure uh, in Scandinavia too, you would find that these rates are actually pretty high. Of course, in developing countries, the adversities can be more extreme and can also go from not just psychosocial, but also biological, such as, for example, malnutrition and air pollution, which has been more recently shown to be a very important contributor uh, to poor child development and mental health. What's the mechanism? Uh, well, certainly it isn't the psychoanalytical mechanism that Freud postulated. Uh, we now have a very good understanding, thanks to the science of brain plasticity, which shows us that it is the early windows of experience that shape brain function. Of course, partly this is, this is constrained by a genetic endowment, but that's only a minor part of the entire explanation for adult mental health. The most important part really is how environmental influences shape brain development during two very important critical periods of development that I want to touch on. The first is in the very early years of life, the first three to five years of life, when we now know that neglect has a double whammy on the developing brain through two different mechanisms. First of all, the lack of a nurturing environment leads to missing the interaction that is so essential to build the sturdy brain architecture. Uh, and essentially, in a very simple way, if you are not stimulated uh, by typically your parents or others in your parent in, uh, in your home environment, brain architecture will not develop in the way that it should. And secondly, because these environments are also associated with what's called toxic stress, stressful circumstances which activate um, uh, the stress circuits, but which, from which there is no release or, or recovery. For example, when there's chronic enduring threats of marital uh, or parental conflict uh, or physical or emotional abuse. More recently, though, we have also recognized a second sensitive phase of early life development, and that has been really the result of the demonstration that most mental health problems begin before the age of 24, and that the peak of maximum onset of mental health problems is actually in adolescence. We often wondered why that was the case. Uh, why was adolescence such a, uh, such a unique uh, phase in the life course for the development of mental health problems? And thanks to revolutionary findings uh, from, again, neurodevelopmental science in the last two, week, uh, two, year, uh, two decades, sorry. Um, and I would recommend those of you who are trying to figure out why you're, uh, if you have an adolescent in your home, why they behave the way they do. This is a great book um, by neuroscientists that I turned to when I uh, had a teenager's a teenager son in my home. Uh, this this, this uh, book wonderfully summarizes the remarkable new understandings of brain development during adolescence, not least the discovery that different parts of the cerebral cortex mature at different periods of time with the limbic cortex that is responsible for what neuroscientists call a hot emotions like rage and thrill seeking maturing about six to 10 years earlier than the prefrontal cortex, um, which is associated with higher ordered executive functioning, such as decision making. And this means that young people are actually evolutionary primed to behave impulsively to seek thrills and rewards. This is actually how we make the successful transition from childhood into adulthood. And so this is an essential part of our growing up. But of course, this priming to behave impulsively and seek thrills presents unique vulnerabilities on the other hand. Those vulnerabilities are created by a variety of different aspects of social change and adversity that happen during adolescence. Of course, dramatic life transitions are the most important, and this is part of growing up in all societies where one moves from being a completely dependent uh, individual, dependent on one's parents for all one's needs, to becoming completely autonomous and independent in a very short period of only six to 10 years of our life course. 
During these years, we are especially vulnerable to being exposed to bullying, violence, sexual harassment from our peers, discrimination, particularly, for example, sexual minorities or also minority groups more generally, and a variety of oppressive social, cultural, and economic circumstances. And it is when one or more of these coincide and collide with this developmental stage that mental health problems are likely to emerge. In other words, if we want to reduce the burden of mental health problems, we need to begin by scaling up what we know works in terms of targeting harmful environments during the early life course. And to do that, we have to recognize that those environments change according to how old one is. So for example, in very young children, the primary environment is the home environment. As children go to school, school environments and peer environments become increasingly common. And by that, I would include the digital environment, of course, uh, uh, especially in the last decade, uh, which has transformed our understanding of environmental influences on the mental health of young people. And of course, neighborhoods and broader societal environments become relevant also as one goes into young adulthood. In the Disease Control Priorities Program, which I led for the World Bank, uh, we identified a number of, of evidence-based interventions that could target these harmful environments at home, parenting interventions to promote early child development in educational institutions, teaching life skills related to emotional regulation and problem solving, promoting a healthy environment in school and college uh, uh, settings, and providing access to low intensity mental health care within these educational institutions. And of course, at a societal level, a number of very, very exciting uh, interventions that could be implemented now, such as cash transfers for low income families and challenging discrimination against minority groups. I wanna end by just giving examples of some of my own ongoing work in India and other developing countries that illustrate how these interventions can be scaled up even in the least resourced parts of the world. Three examples, really. The first is how one can scale up parenting interventions for early child development, probably the most evidence-based early life intervention for the prevention of mental health problems across the life course, but of course, through the pathway of promoting cognitive development and therefore educational attainment uh, in young children. Here you can see the theory of change of the active ingredients of the interventions uh, shown in the figure on the right-hand side. And through the EMPOWER initiative that we have launched at Harvard Medical School in partnership with many institutions in the developing world, we are now creating a digital platform for the training of frontline workers so that they can learn these evidence-based interventions and be offered support and supervision for quality assurance for their delivery. The second kind of intervention is transforming school environments. And over the last many years, I have been working closely with school systems in India um, to examine what aspects of the school environment uh, can actually be modified. And very importantly, how can we engage the agency of children and adolescents to actually be actors, indeed leaders, in transforming the school environment? Such an intervention that focused on the school environment was evaluated in a one of the largest randomized control trials in the poor state of Bihar in India. And we published the findings on the Lancet on the left-hand side and the follow-up two-year findings in, the, in PLOS Medicine demonstrating the large impacts of this intervention that wasn't targeting individuals uh, or, or providing CBT skills for individuals, but instead targeting the school environment through leadership of students and, and observing large reductions in, uh, in, in, in mental health uh, um, uh, distress scores uh, in those schools in which the intervention was delivered by a lay counselor. And finally, within these same school settings, we developed a suite of interventions for those individuals who, were who had distress, you know, adopting the dimensional model. Um, these are individuals who may not necessarily meet clinical threshold criteria, but have distress and would uh, benefit from, from, from problem solving interventions evaluating how a single classroom-based intervention could in increase not just mental health literacy, but demand for, for, uh, 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 for, for these school counseling interventions by a lay counselor, demonstrating how this lay counselor brief intervention based on problem solving just between two to four sessions could provide significant reductions in both mental health severity, but more importantly, youth-defined problem severity, 
Just last month, we published the 12-month outcomes of the same trial, demonstrating sustained effects of this very brief low-cost intervention in schools. And more recently, we have adapted the intervention so that it can be delivered to all students uh, uh, through a app-based uh, uh, delivery in school settings. In closing then, I think what we really do need to do is to embrace developmental science combined with the opportunities for scalable preventive interventions that are using low-cost community-based resources and brief interventions in the following ways. First of all, we need a life course approach from conception through to young adulthood if we are genuinely going to make an impact on reducing the burden of mental health problems. Secondly, this must be an equity-focused approach because we know through a large body of evidence that the disadvantages that associated with poor mental health are disproportionately distributed in the population. We need diverse community-based platforms for the delivery of interventions targeting these determinants, but I'd like to also add, including interventions that are focused on early intervention for young people who are developing the early signs of psychological distress, and again, embracing the dimensional model. We need a convergence of diverse disciplinary approaches and perspective, which has been one of the most exciting things about my work as I work with pediatricians, to child development experts, those who are focused on neuroscience of development across the early life course, and so on and so forth. And But most important of all, we need to embrace the importance of youth engagement and leadership at all levels of actions, because of course, these are all actions that are targeting children and young people. And as the old slogan uh, goes for uh, mental health, and I'd apply that for young people, nothing about us without us. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Vikram. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I have a teenage daughter at home, so I should get that book, I think, maybe. Now, now the early um, intervention that you talk about, how do we spread this information? Uh, you did a, a fantastic job in the schools. Is that something in India? Is that something that can be transferred to other countries? And how do we reach the parents? You had a few um, good pointers there, but can you say something more about how can we reach the parents and can this school project that you did, can that be transferred? to other countries? Well, I don't see any reason why it can't be transferred. Uh, you know, obviously the, the context will be very different and therefore the kind of determinants that operate in school environments will be very different. But let me tell you, disadvantages operate in all parts of the world. I can't speak for Sweden, but the US where I'm currently based has one of the highest rates of unwanted sexual uh, advances uh, ex uh, described by college students. And I'm talking about college students at universities like mine uh, in, in Boston, um, where upwards of 10 to 20% of young women describe being sexually abused by their peers. So to be honest, I think environmental factors operate across the life course. The key thing to remember is that much of the prevention work has focused on teaching young people CBT skills, and that has had a very small effect on prevention. I think we need to recognize that the problems that lead to mental health difficulties are not just in the way we cope with the world around us, but in the poisonous influences in the world around us. And if we're genuinely going to attraction on reducing mental health problems, we need to be very frank that those actions are going to lie outside the narrowly defined mental health sector. And for those of us who work in public mental health, we have to embrace, therefore, these other sectors and the many other kinds of groups of people and disciplines uh, that target those environments. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Earlier on um, today, we talked about social media and, and teenagers or adolescents. Uh, what, what's your view on social media to, to use as a tool? to get information out and I think social media can be very helpful. I mean, you know, I, uh, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of mixed uh, messaging around social media. And mo most recently, I'm sure everyone's been following the uh, disclosure by the whistleblower from Facebook about how uh, Facebook knew for a long time that its social media algorithms were driving young women uh, towards more disordered behaviors to do with their eating, for example. So I think so social media is by no means the savior. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think uh, there is evidence that social media by and of itself 
is bad for your mental health. I think the evidence is much more ambivalent, it's equivocal, and it turns out that a lot of this has to do with how people use social media, uh, and indeed how social media algorithms use vulnerable vulnerabilities um, and, and make things worse. And I think therefore we need, first of all, to think of social media both as an opportunity and a threat, um, and figure out ways societally, because social media isn't gonna reform itself as long as there's a profit motive, um, uh, how we can actually make sure that social media does more good than harm to young people's mental health. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and please stay on for, for a little while and we'll have a panel discussion later on. Uh, now we are ready for our third speaker and on a what so maybe not so stable connection, uh, but uh, fingers crossed everything will work out. Uh, we will have our uh, next speaker, Dr. Dixon Chimbanda. And the focus for our summit is, as you know, new pathways towards mental well-being. And we will now listen to one new pathway or one initiative on how to work with psychological te therapy in a new and very creative way. Now, welcome Dr. Dixon Chimbanda, Associate Professor at the Centre for Global Mental Health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK. Also psychiatrist who lives and works in Zimbabwe and the founder of the Friendship Bench. Please uh, share your findings with us uh, for the Friendship Bench project and hopefully we will have the the internet work for us welcome thank you. thank you very much thank you um i'm really honored to be given this opportunity to share with you uh lessons from the friendship bench um you know that we've picked up over the years with regards to how to improve the mental health and well-being of uh, of communities i'll start off by just briefly giving a a uh, kind of overview of what the Friendship Bench is. So the Friendship Bench, in essence, is a brief psychological therapy which is delivered by trained community grandmothers like Grandmother Ngabu in this file photograph who has been working for Friendship Bench for more than 10 years. We have close to a thousand grandmothers at the moment who deliver therapy on wooden park benches in their communities. In essence, the, the treatment itself is based on, I guess, you know, principles of cognitive behavioral therapy with, uh, with emphasis on what we call problem solving therapy and uh, bits of behavior activation and um, activity scheduling. Um, the work is reflected in uh, our seminal publication from uh, a couple of years ago, which showed that you know these grandmothers could actually be trained to effectively uh, treat common mental disorders such as depression and anxiety. And six months after receiving therapy from a grandmother on a wooden park benches, um, people were symptom free. Um, what we do is pretty simple. Uh, as Friendship Bench, our core team identifies suitable trainers in communities across Zimbabwe and beyond. We train them to deliver the model. They then go on to train grandmothers in their communities. And we allocate wooden park benches in those communities. Our team then facilitates referrals to these park benches to the grandmothers who screen um, people coming to the bench using, using locally validated screening tools. After up to six sessions, sometimes much less than six sessions, clients are referred to join a support group where they get a community collective sort of problem solving uh, initiative where they resolve different problems that they are facing at community level. This is another file photograph of one of our grandmothers. This is grandmother Pussy with a client um, on the bench. Uh, the work that we do at Friendship Bench is, is not new. There are numerous examples of, um, of task shifting or task sharing. This is just an example of a systematic review um, highlighting, you know, task sharing approaches, um, you know, in mental health care, in, in low resource, in low resource settings. I think what has been new for us at Friendship Bench is this realization that 
the work that we do is not only beneficial for the clients, the people who sit on the bench, but it's also equally beneficial for the, for the grandmothers who are providing the therapy. Um, recently, we published work which actually shows how the grandmothers working on friendship bench um, were a lot more resilient in comparison to their peers in their communities who were not working on friendship bench. For instance, we looked at rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, common mental disorders, and we find that the grandmothers have much lower rates than those in their communities. And in fact, this is work which was carried out by a colleague of mine as part of her PhD. Digging deeper into um, what it was that made the grandmothers different who were involved in this work, we, we find that um, this work gives them uh, a sense of purpose. This is grandmother Mary Lee, who again has been with Friendship Bench for, for more than 10 years. And we hear these narratives, these stories from the grandmothers of how they are benefiting from providing this service within their communities. And this is grandmother Wiza. Grandmother Wiza, she's, she's the oldest grandmother still working with Friendship Bench. And um, as far as she's concerned, she, you know, she's, she remains relevant in her community because of, of this work that, that she has been doing. So that's one aspect that we've really learned, which is pretty exciting for us. The other thing that we've learned over the past couple of years is um, the importance of replicating this model in different parts of the country and, uh, and beyond Zimbabwe itself. So I'll just touch on a few replications. Um, this is a replication that we carried out in, Mil in Malawi within an HIV treatment program. And uh, we, from this, this, um, this replication, we actually also learned how the friendship bench could be modified to address the mental health needs of people living with, uh, with HIV. This is uh, a replication of the model using a digital platform in Kenya, where we find that using a modified version of Friendship Bench, which is delivered online using a chat-based um, app, which we call Inuka, was feasible, acceptable, and actually led to an improvement in symptoms. And the grandmothers actually were able to be trained to use these platforms. And um, they're quite, quite happy with the fact that they are able to use these devices to communicate with, uh, with clients. This is an example of um, you know, a replication of the friendship bench you know, within young people living with HIV, where we were focusing on, on adherence, as you may um, know, you know, adherence to antiretroviral treatment in young people is, is pretty challenging. Um, and again, this, this study showed how by integrating a friendship bench model, we are able to, to make a difference in the lives of these, these um, young people. And this is um, another replication where we were looking at a rural community. Um, and so we have quite a number of these replications. And with each replication, which is really in essence sort of an iteration of the friendship bench, we learn something new. And that information goes towards you know, streamlining, fine tuning the model. Um, so that it can be better, more uh, efficient. But one of the one of the other lessons from from the replication is, you know, is the power of the groups. Um, we've learned so much from the groups. Uh, an, an area which we kind of um, overlooked over the years, we are increasingly realizing the power of social capital through the groups that are formed by people who have experienced. The, the bench, um, particularly in the rural parts of Zimbabwe, these, these networks, these connections that are formed at community level in, in rural areas have become so powerful um, in a way that 
enhances the well-being of communities through collective um, you know, participation and, um, and social prescribing, if you like. Um, so this has become one of our focuses you know, in recent years. It's, so it's not just about what happens on the bench, but what's also happening within, within the groups. And um, to conclude, where is all of this um, taking us? Recently, we began compiling the evidence that we have gathered over the years to, to put together what we are calling a friendship bench um, in, a, in a box, um, which will enable people to actually, to actually deliver um, uh, you know, friendship bench on their own in different settings, wherever they are. And this, this fortunately is supported by Zoom. Um, and we are hoping that within the next couple of months, we will have what we believe is a do-it-yourself type kit uh, for people who are interested in, in utilizing this kind of model uh, in different parts, not only of our country, but also different parts of the world. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dixon. And the, the internet was stable, so that was that was excellent. Thank you so much. Now, I have one question for, from uh, the audience. Are the grandmothers paid? Are they employed formally at all? Great question. When we first started, the grandmothers were not paid. Most of the grandmothers get what we call an allowance, which enables them to, um, to collect data and upload data to our server. Because uh, one, one of the critical things in this work is um, collect data collection. And so we have to give them some kind of allowance to enable that. So on average, they get about 20 US dollars um, uh, a month for data. Mm. Okay, good, thank you. Um, did you experience people in such a poor state that they didn't come to the bench? And, and how did you deal with that? And also now when you use uh, digital devices and, and Zoom to come, uh, do you think that you will broaden the, um, um, the amount of people actually coming to you to, to getting this kind of help? So let me start off with um, people with uh, severe um, symptoms or conditions. So this is a stepped care model. Um, we, we obviously have to appreciate the fact that the grandmothers can not manage severe cases. So using our screening tools, we are able to identify those who are severe and need to be referred, say to a psychiatrist or clinic psychologist. For instance, um, people who might have suicidal ideations um, based on our screening tool, they would be referred. Um, and um, what was the second question again? Sorry. Um, uh, if, you get, if you're helped with the, the digital um, formats and also if you, if you have people that you discover is so poor that they, in a poor state that they don't come to the bench, they, you, know, you, don't, you don't reach them. So... Um, with regards to the digital platform, we actually have increased uptake um, of young people and men to Friendship Bench because they prefer to use digital platforms to communicate with their grandmothers and get help. Um, so in a way, we are now beginning to cater for a different population group that we previously didn't cater for um, because previously it was predominantly um, you know, um, women or young girls who, who utilize um, Friendship Bench. Um, as for the uh, severe cases, I think I touched on that, but um, people with severe psychological or psychiatric conditions would tend to go to a, uh, a tertiary facility because when symptoms are severe, they tend to be a lot more conspicuous. Mm. Whereas common mental disorders such as anxiety and depression are more likely to present at primary healthcare facilities. And this is where we tend to capture them through the friendship bench. Mm. I see. 
Excellent. Thank you. You, you, have, a, you have a shout out from um, Zimbabwe. Friendship Bench has become a household name in mental health initiatives in Zimbabwe. Very informative, Professor Chimbanda, and your model is very helpful. So that was just a comment to you that this really works.